Round two wheels this week. I look at two £3,500 600s, Honda's Hornet and Yamaha's Phaser. Also, we get the pillion opinion on both machines. Claire meets ex-motorcycle racer Tommy Robb, and Wayne visits an MOT station. And some more bikers tell us about their dream machines. We've been looking at second-hand bikes recently. We've seen a second-hand sports tourer, a VFR 750, and we've looked at a second-hand sports bike, a Fireblade. They were both priced at £4,500. So what about something in between it performance-wise and a little bit cheaper as well? Here's a couple of examples. It's what you might call the middleweight class, the street bike people seem to be calling them now. Two machines here, even cheaper this time, £3,500. This first one is Yamaha's Phaser. Came out in 1998. The people used to say this was a parts bin special, but a bit unfair, really. It does use bits off other Yamahas. There's a few recognisable bits. The calipers you'll recognise with the blue centres there, off the Thundercat and off the Thunder Ace. And of course, the engine is also from the Thundercat, although they've gone to the trouble this time because it's a naked bike of actually making it look like an air-cooled motor with these fins on the side, which is nice to see. I say naked bike, not quite naked. You've got this half fair in here, which protects you a little bit, but... Um, Essentially, it's what you might call a street bike. 6,000 miles on the clock are registered, and it's three and a half thousand pounds. Let's go and have a look at the Honda. This is the Honda Hornet. Again, 600 cc's, middleweight, same as the Phaser, and a similar kind of story, really, with this. The engine from this is one that Honda have used previously in their CBR 600, which they've used for many years, but basically a CBR 600 engine, but it uses, or should I say, it makes its power quite differently. It's tuned differently, it's more mid-range, it's not as buzzy, not quite as revvy as a CBR. Not as fast, but there's more usable power where you want it, especially around town. More of a retro theme with this one, especially at the front end here, completely naked, no protection at all. Chrome ring on the headlamp there, chrome back clocks, well, plastic chrome back clocks, chrome mirrors, very, very retro, but that's really where the retro theme ends, because as you come down to the back of the bike, it's not retro at all. Big high lift exhaust here, no twin shocks as you would find on a true retro machine and the engine has not even been made to look air cooled at all, it's really just a CBR 600 lump stuck straight in the middle. This is a T registered and this has done less mileage, 3,000 on this and again three and a half thousand pounds. And three and a half thousand pounds isn't exactly a lot of money to pay for a machine that's as closely related to the brilliant CBR 600 as this. The Hornet is definitely what people might call a well-sorted bike. It feels completely together. The handling is very sharp and positive, and the 600cc motor is strong and willing, and it's almost completely vibration-free. The riding position is just about spot on with the foot pegs tipping you slightly forward towards the nice wide and fairly high bars. It's not quite the same story with the Phaser, however. It certainly doesn't feel anywhere near as sharp as the Hornet, and it's only really when riding two machines back to back that you start to realize just how vague the handling is on this Yamaha. The motor has all the mid-range you'll ever need from a 600, even if it does start to feel a little buzzy after a while. The riding position is fine, the seat is comfortable and the half fairing does offer a certain amount of wind protection. The Phaser seat is higher than the Hornets and perhaps it's this which gives it a slightly top heavy feel. It's good for long legged riders but I have to confess that I personally felt much more comfortable and part of the bike on the Hornet. So they're not out and out sports bikes, but they've still got plenty of performance, both 600ccs, both keep up with most things, you won't get left too far behind. The Phaser's good for about 140 miles an hour, Hornet's a little bit slower, 130 odd miles an hour. But I have to say 130 odd on one of these, forget it, you haven't got a chance. 80 miles an hour for about an hour is just about as much as you can stand and even then you'll be completely knackered because there is nothing here, there is no protection, wind straight in your face on your shoulders, on your arms, you're aching. It really is a nuisance. You could put a screen on it. Most of the aftermarket accessory manufacturers will make a screen that would fit this, cost you around about 60 pounds. But uh, as standard, nothing there. Also, you may have noticed on this, 
it's got a side stand. That's it, it's only got a side stand. So tell me this then, Mr. Honda, why can you make a CBR 600 an out and out performance sports machine that's got a main stand, but you can't put one on the Hornet, which is a middleweight, user-friendly, easy to ride bike? I don't know the answer to that. Dashboard on this, very, very basic, no fuel gauge. I hate bikes that don't have a fuel gauge. This hasn't even got a fuel warning lamp, which means when you're riding along and your engine starts to die and you think, oh, hang on, I need to be in reserve, you start fumbling down here because the reserve tap is just there. And if you've got gloves on and you're riding along, it's awkward, it's fiddly, it's a nuisance, it shouldn't be like that. So that's a couple of problems there with the Hornet, but it's a nice little machine. Yamaha, on the other hand, seem to have got things slightly better, a little bit more correct. We've got a main stand on this one, which is great. It's great for maintenance. You can adjust your chain, you can check your back wheel, you could even take the back wheel off. It's easy for cleaning the bike, and it means when you park it in the garage, it's harder for the kids to knock it over. So, 10 out of 10 there, main stand. Dashboard on this is better. We haven't got a temperature gauge, but we don't need a temperature gauge, really. I would much rather have a fuel gauge, which we've got on this. So. If they can do it on the phaser, why can't everybody do it? We've also got a screen on this one, a standard, only a little half fairing, but it is quite good. It does protect you. You sit down in the comfy seat, which is actually higher than the Hornet, much higher riding position, so people with longer legs may prefer the phaser. We often talk about pillions, and we often say, look at the pillion pegs, not too high, not too low, whatever. Look at the grab rail, look at the seat. But we very rarely actually show you a pillion on the bike. So let's change all that. So I need a passenger. Come this way. Wayne, have you, um, have you got a minute? And Wayne will give you the pillion opinion on both of these machines in part two. But right now, he's off to the MOT station. Do you recognize that sign? Well, you should do. Yeah, do you recognise it? Because it's the MOT sign. It's the sign that is on the front of the workshops where you can take your machine for an MOT test. Now then, you must have had, you've been there haven't you? Your bike is more than three years old and every year we have to have it, the test. And it's the test that makes you lose sleep a little bit, worrying that if it doesn't pass the test on Saturday morning, are you going to be able to go out for a ride with your mates on Sunday? Well, what we've done is we've come to a testing station to meet Jeff, a friend of ours, who's going to help us. And what he's going to do is give us, give us some hot tips on the best way to present your bike so it does get through the MOT test. So then, Jeff, tell me, go on, some tips now. Then, if I was bringing a bike into you for an MOT, how could I impress you? Well, you'd impress me a lot, first of all, if it's clean, shiny and looks well. So it looks like I've tried to keep the bike in good order to impress. Exactly. Right then, what other things would put you off even giving it a second look? Second glance, well, the first thing that we look at, if the headlamp has got a cover on it of any form. Or oh, one of these multicoloured things. That's purple, right, blue. Red, whatever, yeah. Yes, got, yeah, right, fair enough. Understandably, because they are illegal, aren't they, though? Indeed, All indeed. Right. Yeah, and then you must have had some quite amusing bikes presented that you knew before you even looked at it, it's not going to pass. So, go on, tell us a tale or two of that. Well, we've had some with broken frames. Even. We've looked down and the frame has been held together with wood. No. Yes. <laughs> the frame that's <laughs> halfway it. down has got a piece of wood in it. And they expect that to pass in a water. And, and th the fact is, th I mean, this brings me to the sense of it being for safety, for personal safety. An MOT allows you to use a bike in good order, doesn't it? You're checking it out for their benefit. It is their benefit. So, so when you do look over a bike, you obviously, I'm sure, check it for all the things that are in the book. Do you look for a few other things for the benefit of the user? Uh, we could tell them the tyres are passable, but the, uh, it would be better if they renew them if they... Yeah, if think winter's like, coming on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What if someone come along and say, say something little, or I'd say it as little, like the indicators weren't flashing properly, or there was perhaps just one light out, maybe a little pilot light? Yes, what, what we do, do then? then? We do the whole test completely, and then we go back to that and replace the bulb that may be blown, or well, the indicator's not working, sort out the wiring on that. Yes, we wouldn't throw it away. No, no, no. You get, yeah, that's fair enough, that's very decent of you. you. must admit, very decent. When you're testing a bike like this, which is a very nice machine, and it's, it's, it's all, well, everybody has to have them, three years old, when it gets to the thir third year of its life, it needs uh, checking. 
Do you, do you think to yourself, well, surely there mustn't be much wrong with this, or do you go right from front to back and give it its full test every time? Every single time it has to go the full Monty. No matter what? No, nope, no matter right. what it looks like. Well, I understand like. that. I mean, it's yeah. what it should do. Yeah. I've got to ask you this now. I noticed mm. this before. Ah. Just let me bring these up. Now, does this mean, these scales here, does this mean you can't have fat bikes? <laughs> you know, what's or the fat riders, for this? indeed. Oh, well, that'd be no good, would it? <laughs> so what's the score with this? Right, um, to accomplish the roller testing, we have to weigh the machine. So we weigh the front wheel, take a reading. Yeah. Roll it over and weigh the rear wheel and join the two together to give us a combined weight. Then together with the sum and figures off the... The readout on there. So you get a, you, you work out then the braking distance and, and the efficiency of the brakes. Presumably. Efficiency of the brakes. Got you. Nice yes. one. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, be very grateful if you just give this a quick check for me, but just don't look too closely at the tyres, you know, if you don't mind, please. <laughs>and Claire meets up with an old friend of two wheels, ex-motorcycle racer, Tommy Robb. One motorcycle racing icon whose career spans over 20 years certainly put motorcycling on the map in Ireland. He is Mr Tommy Robb. Tommy, how are you doing? Good. Hi Claire, lovely to see you again. Good, and you? Tommy, you must have been really passionate about motorbikes because you, you started when you were about 15, that's when you got your first bike, wasn't it? Yeah, well I think like all motorcyclists, you start very young, maybe not as young as the Americans, they start when they're about three and four, but yes, I, I, I did, I saved very, very hard for it, and uh, I think at 50 pounds saved up towards it, and suddenly got the chance to go to Austria with the Scouts and the Jamboree and represent Ireland, but I, I turned that down because I wanted to have this first motorbike. <clears throat> and my father lent me the rest of the money and we bought the first bike for just over a hundred pounds. But I didn't realize then that later I would be in Austria every year at the Austrian Grand Prix. It's funny how fate works, you know. What was your first experience of English circuits? What was that like? My first ever race in England was, uh, I think it was Alton Park uh, in 1958. And I slept on the floor of the boat on the way over because I couldn't afford a berth. And uh, Ralph Renson, who's, who was killed in 1960, met me at Liverpool, took me to Alton Park. And luckily I won my first race in the NSU there from Fraun Perslow of Shrewsbury. It seems hard to think of motorcycle racing without the name Honda being uh, up there, but it was a, a new thing, wasn't it, back in those days? And of course you went on to become a works rider for Honda, didn't you? Yes, well, Hondas first came into the country, I think, in 1959. And by 1962, when I joined them, they were really established. And 62, 63 and 64, I was with them. And little did we realise in those days that they would be bringing us back out to Japan last year. In fact, we did an interview with Jeff from this programme out in Japan uh, in 1998, uh, 50 years later for their 50th anniversary, which was really nice. But of course, everybody knows what a success story Honda has been as have been Yamaha. Now you mentioned in your book something which I think sums up the whole area. You didn't do it for the money but the laughs were priceless. That's brilliant. Well I think so. I th everybody, everybody makes a profession out of sport for money but it's not the money that's the driving instinct when you're younger. It's the fact that you want to win. That's what drives you on in sport and later the money comes with it. And The strange part is that in life whenever you need 
the money when you're starting out in any new career, especially motorbikes or cars, nobody wants to give you any. And then later in life, whenever you become successful yeah, and you're doing very it. well, yeah. everybody wants to give you <laughs> everything. But by that time, you're usually too old to appreciate it or do anything <laughs> with it. Now, you were racing at the time with the likes of Agostini, Halewood, Surtees. What are your memories of, of them? Oh, yeah, terrific. Especially as we still see Agostini at these parade laps every year. Unfortunately, he's still as handsome as ever he was. He doesn't <laughs> seem to have any more wrinkles on him. Uh, but without a doubt, one of my greatest mates and companions and the greatest rider of all times was Mike Hillwood. He'd, he'll never be forgotten. He has never been forgotten. And anywhere that they put uh, a poster up about Mike, the crowd still flock in to see his old bikes yeah. or to hear things about him. Terrific guy. Now, you must be very proud to have such a fantastic tribute paid to you at the beginning of your book by Jeff Duke. Jeff Duke was probably one of the most stylish riders the world had ever seen and the greatest, the greatest rider in his own day. And I think it's probably regrettable that the media of TV wasn't about in Jeff's day because Jeff was so eloquent, he was a handsome guy, he, he put over a wonderful image for motorcycling, but it was radio coverage virtually. And had he had the media of television today, Jeff would have been terrific for motorcycling, he really would. Now a lot of people will actually wonder, is it oil and water running through those uh, veins rather than blood? Because you've had some really serious accidents, you know, you broke your neck, you've got on and raced a bike, you know, through pain. What motivates you to go through that and get back on again? I don't know, I think it's, it's the motivation that's in any sport when you're younger. Um, you're, you're so keen on, on getting to the top of your own particular sport that the injury side of it you shrug off you forget about it i remember going in to my physio one day and said i'm out next wednesday night on a grass track can you have me ready can you bend this straight he said <laughs> tommy i can have you ready every weekend in life but what you're going to be like when you're 60 he said i wouldn't like to promise you and I must admit, now that I've reached pension age and the arthritis has <laughs> set in, it is pretty painful. You're but in those good days, shape to me. in those days, you didn't think about. It. But you see, I was very lucky because your dad, who people know as Bill Smith, we were very lucky. The reason that he and I didn't hurt each other much was because we always fell on our head. <laughs> and um, it didn't knock any sense into him. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, well, I tell you what, it's brilliant to hear that you've still got an active interest in motorsport. As obviously, it's a passion of yours, and you're going to be at the TT this year doing one of the... Yes, we'll be over doing the parade lap in the TT. I'm going to Montlhery in France in May, uh, probably Bewley later in the year, the Ulster Grand Prix. Still having a ride, provided my Zimmer frame gets me to the bike, that is. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's great, because we, we still meet all the old friends who used to race, and you still keep in contact with racing in the modern day. And, and for me, it, it's lovely. It keeps an interest. My wife and son have their dogs to look after and show, and that's their interest. And, and Mine you've got still your passion. Motorbikes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll see you at the TT this year. I look forward to that, Clara. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Now, it's not often, as you probably already know, that I get chance to get involved in a road test because they just won't let me near them flaming handlebars and this is no exception because although I'm involved in the road test what am I doing? I'm sat on the passenger seat on the pillion seat of both this Hornet here and this Phaser over here now I'm a lot more comfortable sat on this piece of stone than I was sat on this for two hours because what is this? a pathetic piece of foam with a bit of vinyl over the top they've obviously on this Hornet considered no comfort at all for the passenger including not only this limited padding, hooks, hooks that get you right in the leg here on the inside of your thigh. Then, when you've got your foot on the foot peg down here, unless you've got a pair of boots on, you're gonna burn the inside of your ankle. Because that does get warm, even though it's a heat shield, it does get warm. Another discomfort factor. The only positive point I can say about this is that the foot pegs are quite far forward. And so that means by having the forward foot pegs, the tendency is for you to let you lean forward and join the rider. And there's no doubt about it, that's good for safety. So forward and low is a good point. It also enables you to get your hands on the grab rail if you don't want to hold on to the rider. And there's no way that I'm getting my arms around Paul. So you hold on to this grab rail comfortable and it's not so bad apart from those other negative points. Unlike this thing, 
here, whereby we have a big fat passenger seat for a bit more comfort. That's on the assumption that you haven't got a particularly back, big backside with all the comfort you need. So that suits me. The only disadvantage with this particular one, because of the location of the foot pegs, which are a little bit further back and a little bit higher, not only do I feel like Lester Piggott, and if you're my size, six foot six, sorry, five foot six, that is a problem. If that's the case, what's it like if you are six foot six on the back of this? Big problem. What happens is, because of the foot pegs, your tendency is to lean back a little bit, which means if you have got your hands on this substantial grab rail, and it looks quite nice, it's useless because you're trapping your hands behind you. You've no room. And it isn't as though you gelled with your rider. And after all, safety is a paramount. So which is the best then? Well, there is no short answer to that because six or one and a half a dozen the other. This little baby has got a fat seat, but I'm not keen on the foot peg position because of holding on the grab rail. And this one has got a horribly thin seat, but the foot peg position and riding position for the passenger is an awful lot better. So which one do I go for? I don't know. But I don't know if you've noticed, but the keys happen to be in the ignition on these bikes. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> On two wheels next week, Jeff rides the road-going version of Honda's new world superbike contender, the VTR SP1.